right, where is everything here? Let me go to here. Everybody, I think I am live. Michael, he's making his debut. We're just finishing setting up a couple things on Facebook. So everybody can bear with me. Let me turn Alexa down. Alexa, turn down. All right, hopefully that's good there. Finishing setting up the Facebook. And get ourselves on. All righty. Mr. Kastner, can you hear me, buddy? Turn yes. Rock and roll. I've got my drinks, my nuts, everything. I'm ready to go. You ready to go? Awesome, man. Well, let's see. I actually can hear you a little bit from upstairs. Isn't that funny? Well, try to be quiet then. Let's... Oh, no, it's just barely. Can you hear me coming through it? Oh, yeah, I hear you good. I mean, in the background. Do you hear background? Nuts, everything. I'm ready to go. You ready, ready to go? I am good here. I just created a watch party and now we'll just double checking to see. We got you. All right. We got the watch party going. We got on Facebook Live. You are tagged we're on Zoom and we are in the corner here, buddy. And I appreciate you being here. Um, last month, a lot of my stuff was based off of people, vendors, and different uh, people that we have in our and what they can do for us. Obviously, you being on the team, you being around me quite a bit, you understand the ins and outs. But one of the things I want to share, showcase is I like to talk about people because you are very humble. You've been very successful the last two years. You've, you've created such a synergy and an impact, not only for this team, but when we were at Keller Williams and coming over to EXP and kind of all the highs and lows of, of my challenges that I've been facing. And, and I'm going to let you share a little bit of your story of, of some of your health, if you choose, and kind of where you've come from. But a lot of agents, especially coming from this challenging time of where we are in the market with Corona, what it's done to people and how that all comes into play. And so what takes shape is how, what you did in how you overcame those challenges and how you became the person you are today. I knew you were once a, you know, and we say $400,000 sales agent and now compared to with close to $6 million in sales and just doing it in two years where the average real estate agent does less than a million dollars and they've been doing this for quite some time. So first and foremost, Michael, welcome and tell us a little bit about your, your real estate path. Okay, um, my real estate path. So I started um, a long time ago. I won't say how long ago because then it shows my age. But a long time ago as an investor, um, got my license way back when originally, just when I was doing investing, but didn't really do any buying and, uh, or any selling of it. So I came to Charlotte a few years ago, uh, went and got my real estate license. Uh, it was in 2000, end of 2017. Uh, got my license, got all my training out of the way, um, got sick through most of 20, 2018. It was out pretty much the whole year until about the very end of 2018. And uh, I did, um, I think, one sale in 2018 for about 200,000. And in 2019, I started off um, the year really good. Um, ended up finishing with about 2.8 million in sales. And then in this year, um, I had high expectations. I thought it was gonna get hammered because of the virus, but I just shifted the way I was doing business. Never really missed much of a beat and scheduled to close um, in the next two weeks on a couple, assuming those go under through the first six months, I'll have about 3 million in sales for the first six months. My target goal is 
five to six million this year. I can't hear you. Sorry, it helps if I'm not on mute. Okay. Um, I was saying that I appreciate your, your answer and what you did in, in hats off because obviously with it has been a challenge. We had to overcome the end of April, beginning of uh, March, I mean, um, yeah, April and May. Yet you're still doing that volume in, in where you are to, I mean, that's what you years typically like most agents don't even get that but the main point of where i was where i was going with this is this show a lot of them are real estate agents who are out here and they're trying to figure out direct trying to figure out how to make their business grow what that looks like what they can do now you you know me i'm very big income producing activities i'm very big on like you know how many phones make how many contacts did you make but you one of the key things is is i don't really care how you get your contacts as long as you get your contacts and you took that and you said you're right brock i don't want to call for sale by owners and expires but you found a way in open houses so share a little bit about that path and what that looks like for you so if an agent's out there who's thinking about it be like huh maybe that's something i could do share share that path and that avenue you decide to prove me like I'm still getting my numbers but I'm doing it in open houses well I would say it start by saying that um, you have to find out what works for you but it's you have to be consistent so a wise old real estate agent who's very old Brian Saldarini once told me that whatever you do stay consistent at it and keep doing it and so um, when it started doing open houses um, it was a process of learning um, and practicing. And so um, over the months, I got better at it to where now I try to do five in a weekend. I usually can get four, sometimes only three. But Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just for those of you who are listening, he tries to do five a weekend, averages probably 16 to 20 a month. And for those of you who are wondering, like, what's the average? The average real estate agent does two to three an entire year. Just want to make sure he understands that, that what you do, you have to focus on and you have to hit it hard. Not like, well, I'm going to do it whenever. So I just want to make sure people understand what that means when you say, I try to do five a weekend. So go ahead. So again, it comes down to consistency and that's what it is. It's, it's a, um, no get rich quick scheme. There's no easy path. It's finding out what works for you, but sticking to it and doing it. There are days, weekends, uh, and I am blessed that my kids are grown. So I don't have children on weekends, but there are weekends mm -hmm. where I really want to go do things, uh, barbecues or whatever. And, um, I have to work around that, you know? So I basically am gone from 11 in the morning to about eight o'clock at night on Saturdays and then on Sunday afternoons. So if I'm going to do it on the weekends, you got to work around it. That's the sacrifice. There are days when I'd really rather not do it. I want other things I'd like to do, but you have to stay committed. You got to stay focused. And there is no magic answer. It's just being consistent and taking what you do, getting good at what you do. You don't have to be great. Just do what you do well and be consistent and do it every, in my case, every single weekend. And then from there, it's just a numbers game. Um, I use the example of, on an average open house, I get between four and six people come through. That includes people who are just casually looking through, um, neighbors, uh, represented buyers. But if you do a numbers and you get four to six and you do five of them, you're going to get 20 to 30 people. And out of that, generally, I can get three to four good leads. And out of that, I can usually get out of those three to four, usually one of them is really a hot lead. So... You get one hot lead. If I told you you get three to four good leads a week, one really hot lead, that's 50 nice. a year. That is how you're going to get the results you get. It's just consistently doing the same thing over and over. And tell us a little bit, a lot of people doubt open houses. 
in your business alone, I know you just picked up that one listing for 400,000 that you met at open house. How much of your business would you say in volume comes from open houses just this year alone? Well, the, the listing I picked up yesterday was 500,000. <laughs> so it was 500,000 listing. So um, I would say just off the top of my head, um, I picked up a double side of a deal, um, which turned out to be about a million. So there was a third of what I've got so far. Um, I've got the listing, so there's half a million. So, and I picked up another buyer that bought a different property at about four. So I would say if I had to just guess, maybe half, maybe half of my volumes coming through open houses. So you would, you would say right now that you're looking at probably one and a half to 1.7 million? That I, of the almost 3 million I've got, yes, came from open houses. So guys, for those of you doing the numbers if you're not doing a million plus if you're not doing a million to two million he's just doing open houses alone and that's generating his business which then cultivates what else is going on to pipeline so the biggest thing mike that i see with open houses in success is how you have conversations with people because you just think that they're just going to because I mean, buyers now are pretty much they, they know it's they're like it's like going to a dealership. It's like I don't want to talk to you, leave me alone. But you transform that, and you kind of have a really good script to make people feel at ease and giving them your information. Because without information, it's it's kind of like grocery shopping. You see a lot of people, but you don't know who they are. So, t- talk to us a little bit about like what's your scripts and how you're handling that. Okay. Well, I guess the first point is my objective. What am I trying to achieve? Um, and when you look at an individual person who comes in, you first have to um, be able to ascertain what their motivation is. And again, if it's somebody who's a neighbor or uh, something like that, what I'm trying to get from them is just feedback. Because most importantly, I want to get the seller, the homeowner, um, good feedback so they can help them be constructive and, and how they can improve and better sell their property. So I'm trying to get that. The next thing I'm trying to do of of people who are buyers, I'm trying to get four pieces of information. That is their name, their home address, their phone number, and their email. Hey, Mike, say that again. So those take, there's three things he tries to get. What are they again? Four things. Their name, their phone number, their email address. What was the last thing I (laughs) <laughs> blank name address name home address email phone number no the home email. address thank you i knew i missed something name home address email address phone number and so what i do is when they leave um because one of the things i don't do that i think is a mistake agents do is they hand out information i do not do that um, because if you hand somebody something they have no reason to give it back to you so what i tell people in the age of technology that if they want to see it, I have my laptop open and I said, here's the information and I can send it over to you right now. And so people will generally say, okay, great. So I say, okay, what's your name? They give me a name. I said, now I'll send you an email with this property. What's your email address? And so in the conversation, I'll say, okay, so let me send you a text. So, you know, have my email address in here. So when you get it, you're going to know it's coming from me. So I always will get their phone number from there. And so then let's, hold on one second, not to interrupt and pretend like literally we're at a coffee shop right now, because you said, you said a couple of key things for those of you listening. One is you ask them, can I have your email address so I can send you information about this property? Is that correct? Is that what you stated? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So what you did there was you attached a value to them to make it purposeful and why it's important for them to be able to get that, that email address, not, Hey, send me over your email address. Right. What they're thinking it's open-ended like, Oh, you just want to bombard me. No, now it's purposeful. You attach the property to them to be able to get their contact information. And then the second part you added value. Well, let me back up because the reason I don't do a flyer is because if they ask, can I have information on this house? And I say, sure, here's a flyer. Oh, by the way, can I get your email address? They're not going to give it to you. So it's important to understand why I don't hand out flyers is so they will give me that. No, so, I, yeah. I, I think that's 
second because it's we talk about it all the time the value proposition because how many how many open houses do you think they went to do you think this is the first one what Correct. separates you from the other open houses that they went to and you're already providing value for them and then the reading you said it let me get your phone number so I can text you my information so you can recognize it when you get it. And that's, that's another phenomenal line right there. And it, guys, scripts, that's all it is. And then the fourth thing is to get their home address. I will, by this time I will have found out either they own or they're renting. So if they own, it's easy. You go down the price valuation, property valuation uh, script. I can send you a valuation. How long before you think I'm moving? But if they say I'm just renting, then I say, well, we get other properties that come up. What I'll do is I, in case I need to, I can mail you information on it too. If you give me your home address, I can, if I comes up, I can mail you something too. And usually by that time they're giving you whatever you need. So then with that, what I do is I do um, four touches from that point on. So once they How leave, many? I do four touches within the first five days. So once they leave, either that day, it depends on how busy I am, is I try to send them a text ASAP. Say, hi, this is Mike. This is my number because I have an, uh, don't, do not have a local area code. So you'll know it's me. Um, if I told them I was going to send them uh, my home search app, it was attached into there. Anything I told them I would send through there, I would do that. And then I'd say, I'll be following up with you with an email on this property or if there was other properties they were in, interested in, I will be following up the next day, um, which is usually Monday, um, with an email. Also on Monday, I send out a thank you card. Thank you for stopping by. It was a pleasure meeting you and your wife or whoever it was. Um, just wanted to let you know, I'd love to work with you in the future. If I can, send a thank you card. And then I turn around around Wednesday, Thursday, and I'll follow up with a phone call. To say, hey, I want to make sure you got the information I sent you. Did you have any questions on it? Would you like to go see it, the property, or something like that? So I get four pieces of information, four touches within the first four days. So taking notes, guys, four touches in five days. A lot of times people don't know, like, what do I do next? How does that look? He's email. He's reaching out to them four times, four different uh, in several different communication styles. Correct, Mike? Yes. yes and doing it within five days. Okay. All right. What else do you got? Mm -hmm. That's basically it. Just a <laughs> follow up. Yep. There you well, go. A big component that drives people crazy is, and I'm a very big advocate of this too, where you both speak the same language, which drives me crazy. One is open house assignment and times you go and put the open houses out. So I'm gonna tell you what the average real estate agent does. And for those of you who do not know, you can Google open house, seven levels of strategies, whatever you want, seven levels of open house, Googling it. So this is all the way up to the highest level of level six. And level six starts signs being placed out on Friday because the average agent usually puts out signs an hour before their open house or the morning of their open house. And then they waste the owner's time period of two or three hours. And then they go pick up their signs and then they're done for it. And they've only had like two people because, or one person, not even anybody, because all they did was sign in the yard because that's, you know, because I guess the for sale sign doesn't make sense to anybody. And they think like, well, let me put it in the yard here. And then they go to the end of the neighborhood and then they'll put it in the neighborhood and then that's it. And it's like, okay, how come I didn't have anybody? So Mike, tell us how many signs you put out and when do you put them out? I put them out um, on Fridays. That's my Friday day. And I guess my biggest uh, frustration, if um, I'm following behind, like let's say an agent does one on Saturday and I'm doing it on Sunday, my biggest frustration is they don't put out many signs. So to me, uh, my goal is, yeah, obviously you have one in the yard, then I put one at every intersection. And if it's off of a main road, then I will put four, two in each directions, one at the entrance coming from the left and right, and one that it's about a hundred feet away so that people coming can see it from a distance. So depending, I put out as many as, uh, as you know, um, I put out as many as 17 signs at one open house. If it's kind of in a neighborhood with a lot of twists and turns, 
Um, and then, you know, as few as if it's like off a main road, as few as four. But I don't know that I've really ever put less than four out. And as far as another thing that I've seen, I, it, it fascinates me. It really does. Actually, my Brielle, my seven-year-old, we she goes and she looks at the signs. She goes, Daddy, look at that person's signs. They're missing the time. Because I've told her, like, look at it. Like, who the hell knows when this open Great, you got an open house sign, but like they don't have the time. Like, when is the time that the open house is going to be? So, do you make sure that you actually have a rider that shows what time period you do in your open house? I do. And so, the key thing is, but also touch base on is what I notice, and I try to do a lot differently, is there are agents out there that will do handwritten, look like they're really cheap. Um, the times on there, they'll see things scratched out different things like that. I try to use high quality because it's a reflection of who you are. But the, the, the time header signs, it's important at least to put them as they're coming into their first term from each direction. So there's two you definitely want as an absolute minimum. Um, I put one about halfway into the intersect, uh, into the property when they're getting through there, depending on how far in the subdivision they are, and one at the house. So as an absolute minimum, um, there are four time headers. Yeah. It, it just baffles my mind and I'm seeing agents like that. Um, you know, we, we've entertained putting out balloons. Sometimes it's a little bit challenging because of the thunderstorms and everything else like that. We've put out flags. Um, anything that catches people's eyes, especially in busy, busy intersection is, is something that we've learned to try to draw in people because agents, it's like, I'm pretty sure Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but if nobody comes to your open house, are you and the seller happy? Uh, no. So, so you put in what you, you, you get what you put in. That's what I was trying to say. So if you barely do the work and if you don't put in the signs, your expectations. Now, at the same token, everybody, let me just tell you about this too. And this pisses me off tremendous is when and you don't do this, Mike, but when I hear agents, especially in the beginning, and they and they say, Brock, I didn't get anybody. It sucks. This was a waste of time. Drives me crazy. Because I then follow up with them. I said, okay, well, all right, maybe you prepped. Maybe you did everything, okay? You did everything you're supposed to do. I practiced this, Brock. I did whatever you want me to do, and I go out there and do it. And then I say to them, well, during that time period, how did you do that? Did you at least call your sphere? Did you lead? In, did you income produce? Did you go through your database? Did you do something at least real estate act related? I mean, you're in a strain. You have no excuse for dishes. You have no excuse for laundry. You have no excuse for vacuuming. Did you at least make it productive during the two hours and get information or send out information or text people? Did you go to Facebook Live? Did you do anything like that to share with people what you're doing? And and so, I mean, it. So let's just say to you, because I know you do this, so this is easy. So if nobody shows, what do you, what are you doing during that time period, Mike? Well, my main goal is to uh, try to prospect. So um, we get leads. There are uh, a lot of conversion leads or leads that have low conversion rates. So that's when you can usually make the quick phone calls. They take about 30 seconds. I'll look up a text and do that. So I get a lot of my contacts out that way. But I tell people, and I've talked to patients who said, Mike, I've done four, five, six open houses in a row, and I didn't get a single lead out of it. And so the thing is, what you have to do and keep in mind is, one, it's going to happen. You've got to be consistent. You just got to keep doing it over and over and over. Um, I think it was, I read somewhere they said that, uh, you know, um, uh, Reggie Jackson is one that one I heard who um, is a strikeout leader or was when I read this article, but yet he led the majors in home runs or something. So he, he, but he strikes out a lot, but the point was you're going to get some goose eggs. So you find an activity that's productive while you're there, but you don't quit. You just keep going on. And in the end, you have to understand it's a numbers game. The numbers are going to work out for you. But at the same time, when you're doing it over and over, you're going to get better at it. You're going to get more comfortable. Um, I remember when I first started, there were people come in and you kind of feel awkward. You don't know where to say, you don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. Now, pretty much anybody can walk in and I just am who I am because I've done this literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So, 
speaking of which, and, and we have a couple more left, you've done it hundreds and hundreds of times. And you could say that now. In the beginning, though, you, you couldn't have done it a hundred times because it's the beginning. I mean, everything start, you have to start. So what did you do to practice? And I know role-playing is the answer. So besides just saying role-playing, like a little bit on that and what that looks like in your life. Well, role-playing really was the answer. So um, my wife knows my script pretty well, as does my daughter, because I practiced enough on them. Riel knows mine pretty well. There you go. And I know my wife's laughing right now because she's laughing at me for that reason. But at the same time, sometimes you just got to go up there and you got to come to the plate and you, you, know, you got to make the best at bat you can. So you just got to go out there and, and really just start doing them and, and let the people come in. But what you do is, when you, I like in the initial stages especially, but I always like to have another agent with me because um, even, I always like to say, even when you take the greatest quarterback of all time, we all know that's Peyton Manning. So when you take the greatest quarterback of all time and uh, he still had coaches. So when you have somebody who can perform at a high level, you don't just stop. You still have people critiquing you and improving your, um, your, your basics, your fundamentals. And so that's one of the things that I think you got to do is have somebody giving you constructive criticism. You can always up your game better and you never slack off or take what you know and take it for granted. You know, you're so true on, and a lot of people find this, and you know me, I don't care what firm you work for or what you do. And, and I was telling somebody the other day, one of my role play partners is PJ at Keller Williams. And they're like, you role play with PJ? I mean, he's Keller Williams, you're ex EXP. I'm like, I give a rat's ass what you work for. He brings good role play to me and hopefully I do to him. And I only want to work with top agents and top people who know how conversations your firm that you work for what you do has nothing to do with what goes on up here and how you can talk here so it's so important that people understand like role playing is such a key ingredient in working with high level people because role play Bryce all day long but real and Bryce aren't going to get me to the direction that I need to get to I got to role play with high quality people do this Mike is do you have available, because I got a bunch of people on here and we got some comments. What days are you available that maybe somebody could role play with you? Uh, it depends on the time and all that, but I can pretty much fit them in on most days. It just depends on the time specifically. So if you play back, Mike, and we put in his contact information, but you can also find him on Facebook. Um, but you can leave a message in here and leave a comment as well that, I challenge you to put Mike to the challenge. Um, it's so important. Like we love it. Like we call it stump the chump. Jeff Glover was the one that shared that with me, but like, I love it when I'm put on the place. Like, all right, Brock, I got a question for you. I got a role play for you. I got an objection for you. What does this look like? Uh, you, I mean, you did it today to the guy up in New York that we're talking to. You're like, I'm ready to role play. What do you want to role play? I can do it. Anything, anything you want. What do you want? But that's the confidence that you bring the table and it takes time to do that but if you keep procrastinating it you never know um so anything you want to end on mike anything you want to add say do what do you what do you got to leave with people who some agents out there who might be struggling and trying to get through this corona and knowing that we don't know what's as far our numbers keep going up who knows what's going to take shape they're they're thinking that we could be back back at our, our position again what will to those people out there listening? Well, I would say, um, really, I mean, adversity is a part of life. And you have to make a choice and a decision on how you're going to react to the adverse situation you're in. Nobody saw the virus thing coming. And from what I saw, a lot of agents sat back and said, hey, there's nothing I can do. And then there were agents that said, hey, I'm going to find a way to get around this. And that, to me, is a life lesson right there. Um, so you have to make a choice to say, I'm going to continue to work hard. I'm going to continue to fight on. I'm not going to give up. Uh, I'm going to find a way to adjust and shift my business on how I can generate new business. And that I think is the, uh, would be my advice. Okay. Um, Mike, it was a pleasure. I got, let's see, Timothy James Cole. You know him? Tim. Hey, Timmy. Says, 
He says, a fantastic person to work with and for. I've learned so much from Mike in life and business. So uh, hats off to you, Mike, on that. I, I paid Tim to say that. Don't lie. Yeah. Sandy, Sandy Brown. Sandy Brown hey. says, come sell my house, Mike. Sandy Brown says, I'm sorry. I will come up there and we'll go to dinner. Uh, and, of course, your beautiful daughters, wow. Jennifer and Taylor. Hello to you, ladies. Hello to Lee out there. Um, question, Nancy. And he is, Nancy says, I got a question for you. I had my North Carolina real estate license. I let it expire. What would I have to do to get that back? And how do I become a broker now? Okay. Well, that one's a little bit more of a challenge one. That's that's uh, dealing with the real estate commission. Um, Nancy, or the mingle. Nancy, if you want, text me or call me and I can help you out with that. That's more on the mingle school real estate and get you probably going to, actually it's a good time because everything's on online so you'd have to go through the online course again depending on how far you expired you might just have to pay like the renewal fee I don't know yet so we can call me and I can get you some clarity around that um, does anybody else have any questions I'm just kind of going through the comments here to see if anybody has anything for you Mike um, but no I, I do appreciate your time Mike I you've definitely been an asset to the team my personal life as well and, and uh, I wish you all it's great having you if you got anything for mike you can reach out to him i am him text him email him i'll put his contact information if you are looking for mike to help you sell your property and one of the things with mike he's very good he's very empathetic he's going to give you the emotional side of it he is teaching me how to do that i'm working through that but uh he, he is, uh, is somebody that definitely can uh, help you out and i appreciate your time mike being on here all right, see ya. All right, buddy. Have a good one.